Gail Fugit, uh, CEO and President of the Advertising Research Foundation. I'm here with Erwin Gottlieb, friend, colleague. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, chairman of Group M. And it's been an exciting week at CES. You're actually known as being the mayor of CES. I don't know if you knew that. The mayor? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was the emperor. Be, oh, the emperor! I like that. That's I'm excellent. Kidding. I'm kidding. I'm a short Jewish. The emperor kid. has no clothes, because <laughs> you want to get out there and tell the truth about it all. That's right. right. You do. Yeah, I like that. That's good business skill to have. I'm not sure it's been an amazing week. I am sure it's been an exhausting. Week. Yes. Right? We'll say and, more about that. And and the sad part of it is, I remember years ago, I used to come out here on my own, and I would spend three days that were just in depth. Yeah, same version. Yeah. And it was wonderful. Yeah, there's nothing like and, that. And uh, now, um, I mean, I literally did two presentations on CES before I saw the floor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have to. That's tough. You, well, you prep in advance. You kind of have to find out what's going to be there mm -hmm. before you see it. Um, Lisa and I and Jack actually do a walk around. Mm -hmm. We get contractors badges and we do a walk around. Can you talk a little bit about what you what you what you saw this year or your take? I you know I've I've um, read some of the publicity. It's not um, there wasn't one thing in most of the press that stood out this year as contrast to maybe other years. What's your take on it? We haven't had so some our take, years of experience. Our take is very very different, just generally, mm -hmm. and we come at it with a fundamentally if you talk to all the pundits, they're out there to analyze and rate the shiny new objects. That's not what we do, right? By the way, it's not like I have an aversion to shiny objects, but we're not in the business of talking about shiny objects. And the truth of the matter is, if you look at the track record of most of the pundits out there, right, the top 10 this or the top 10 that or the best in show of this, how many of those things actually A, made it to market? Mm -hmm. And how many of them made it to market and didn't crash and burn on day one? Right? Mm -hmm. And so we stopped looking at it from that angle many, many years ago. I doubt that we ever actually looked at it that way. What's your approach? Our approach is um, what does it mean? How can it evolve? The implications. Yeah, what are the yeah, implications? And what's it going to look like in two years, in five years, in seven years? What does it so mean? So you're actually thinking about... What does about it mean to the business? Yes. And because I'm a media guy, we look at marketing implications mm -hmm. and we look at media implications. Right? So you're prognosticating and whether it's going to be around in five years. Yourself I'm, I'm look prognosticating on the shape of the technology mm -hmm. in five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I can give you examples. Yeah, please. Well, how does this year seem? Just what's your big picture on this year? Because I have so many things I want to talk to you about. I, want, I definitely want to get into this changing how media, many days have we got? media landscape. I know, you could definitely do that. I want to get into this changing media landscape and viewability and some of those, those topics too. Well, so. it's all related. I mean, back in 1999, we wrote a deck that said that media, data, and technology would converge. And that's very much in the past tense, mm -hmm. right? Today, we talk about a fourth vector, which is actually distribution, and media defined as virtual shelf space. Because the nature of brick and mortar shelf space and the role of brick and yeah, mortar like shelf space is evolving, right? Um, all you have to do is look at disposable diapers as a category and see what's happening there. And then beyond that, the role of media itself has changed. And I'm happy to touch on that. Yes. Be well. So if, if you stopped me in an elevator 15 years ago and said, what do you do for a living, right? You know, if I said, we do media planning and implementation, the average civilian would have no idea what I was talking That's about. That's true. Right? If I said that our role is to create awareness for our clients, brands, and products, and sustain that awareness, or mitigate the decay of that awareness, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you particularly, mm -hmm. uh, the ARF's membership, yep. understands those concepts, yes. right? 
and the Bill correlation Brands. Girl. And, and Bill Brands, the correlation to reach, yes. the flighting patterns that you use, the communication strategies, all of that stuff. That's what we do for a living, right? It is the creation of awareness and the mitigation of the decay of the awareness that you created. Or, you know, if the brand has seasonality, it's matching the, the awareness levels to the seasonality. We have had circumstances, of, you know, 20 years ago where we were looking at unaided awareness. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, today, we have a level of granularity of data that supports decisioning and allows media to activate against all of the other levels of the marketing funnel. And you can identify consideration, you can identify preference, you can study purchase cycle at the census level. And You've been pretty optimistic on, on our stage at our conferences about these things coming together. Um, I would say yeah. more optimistic than yeah. other the folks way, sitting on these panels with well, you. If I wasn't optimistic about it, I wouldn't be coming to work. Yeah. Right? But I think the bigger thing Where does that is, come from, though, that optimism? It comes from the fact that we actually have a strategy. We've given it a, a substantial amount of thought. Mm -hmm. And I happen to work for a company that's invested a few billion dollars mm -hmm. to build out the tech and sort out the data. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, there was a great line that came from one of the agencies, I think it was actually YNR, long before they were part of WPP. But I think it went something like, leading brands have to do leading things. Yeah. Right? Well, if you're a leader in a space of where the world's leading media yes. and leading it's good. I, love, I really like that lens a lot. It's like, what well, would a leader do? Is, is what would a leader do? Thing? We have a responsibility. Absolutely. Right? And it's not about sitting back passively and and then bitching about why we can't do stuff, mm -hmm. right? I tell our people all the time, I don't want to hear about this stuff. Don't bitch to me. Mm -hmm. Find a light switch, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's good. And uh, that's what we have to do. Right. So you've taken a really bold stand at, at Group M, uh, which I applaud. I mean, look, the ARF, we pride ourselves at the ARF on taking an objective stand. Um, and bringing forward points of view, and you've taken a strong, a strong stand and point of view in this whole area of viewability and really catalyzed a lot of conversation in the industry. Well, we were hoping the industry would take a stand. Right. When the IAB took a stand that we viewed as <clears throat> inadequate, I'm being polite. I was going to say something far, far worse, but I'm being That's polite right. today, right? Um, when they took a stand that we viewed as inadequate, we decided we'd create our own position. And I hope everyone follows it and it becomes an industry position. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, fine. How's it going? It's going quite, cool. it's going quite well. Yeah. And by the way, can anybody argue that we took an unreasonable position? I think, I think anybody that takes a stand toward Helping the consumer receive what we have to offer right. and measure happen. it properly. And, I mean, to and, me, it wasn't just and about then giving it back to sales, right? Correct. This and to me, it wasn't just about work. giving one sector of the media business a hard time, right? I don't pay a television network if they clip 10 seconds of my commercial. Mm -hmm. The comparisons that we do, right, when we allocate across media types, those comparisons are done on a quantitative basis. Mm -hmm. We don't throw a dart at a dartboard, right? There is math behind the work. Mm -hmm. If that math is based on apples and oranges, right, one view is measured as two seconds, 50% viewable, and the other assumes 30 seconds and fully viewable, then you're not going to get the right outcome. Mm -hmm. And if you think you are getting the right outcome, you better rethink it, right? So the first thing you have to do is create a context where you get to apples to apples comparisons or as close to it as possible. And so that's why we did what we did. Yeah, well, and I, I think 
to, from, from our vantage point. But we're straying from the subject of cons the consumer electronics. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, let's get back to the electronic shop. <laughs> okay, so it's not about the shiny object, it's the implications. It's a long term thing, right? Um, did you want an example? Yes. So of four, four years ago, we were here. Um, we identified a technology. It was the quantum dot. Right? What is it? It's a British company at IP. Technology was de actually developed several places in the world, including Israel. And a liquid crystal display, a television, mm -hmm. standard television, is made up with, of crystals that change colors when an electric charge is applied and they're directed to change colors, but they don't generate any light. And so you need to edge light them or back light them. They reflect, they reflect directionally, which is why if you're looking at a television set there, you don't want to be over there, yeah. right? And all that stuff. Um, we looked at this technology, which essentially um, used a I'm going to call it a spraying device to apply nanocrystals, electrosensitive nanocrystals, to a clear sheet of mylar. And essentially, that because. became the television panel. Mm -hmm. You sandwich that mylar That's between fascinating. two pieces of glass. Yeah. And you put a processor on it, you put a power oh, supply on it, you yeah. light it, and you're there, right? And we predicted that that technology had the potential to shave 60 to 70 percent of the cost out of manufacturing. The tolerances were quite achievable. Right? The old production methodologies, achieving tolerances was painfully difficult, which is why the cost of screens went up almost exponentially as they got larger. We predicted that screens would get cheaper, they would get bigger, they would get better. Well, that sounds really good, unless you're an electronic manufacturer. And if you are an electronic manufacturer and you anticipate that your cost per unit is going to drop to a third of its current price, you either sell three times as many or your top line goes down. Right? Yep. And by the way, as your unit cost drops, you become commoditized and your margins shrink. Absolutely. And so what do you do to preserve both your top line and your profits? Well, you push it at market. And so you start giving people things that they don't necessarily they've never asked for and they don't need. Mm -hmm. right? By the way, that was true even before quantum dot. If you looked at 3D TV, for example, right? We were the ones who sat there and said, nobody's going to sit in their living room with those glasses on. Right? Um, by the way... What do you think of ocular rub? What do you think of that? Are you going to sit in your living room well, with I'm, a helmet I'm, on I'm your actually, head going like I'm this? I'm actually uh, on our website right now with one of those on our film to okay. television city. Okay. Yes, it's quite mortifying. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. Right? And by the way, you have to kind I do of like the experience though. Yeah, but well, it depends on the content you looked at. Yeah. Right? Well, it was a, fa it was a fashion show. It was like fashion week. Oh, okay. It was pretty cool. Well, sci-fi has a great one. It's all rendered. Skydiving. And, and it's, it's incredibly expensive to do it. Mm. I think eventually there are enormous applications for it. Mm -hmm. I think today there are applications for it in gaming. Mm -hmm. You know, full of Yeah, up, right? absolutely. But I don't see it as, I mean, by the way, 3D did gain some adoption. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't significant enough to right. be Right, well, Erwin, I really, I really like that example a lot because it definitely does what you said. You talked about the business implications, you talked about projecting out into the future, and, and not just whether you thought it was going to spark or not, but why or why not. You know, is it right. going to bring value and meaning to right. to consumers' so lives? So, if you look at it in today's context, you can sort of paint a picture of where things are going to, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. if you're a television manufacturer, you want your TV to be the smart hub in your home, right? If you're Samsung, wants the refrigerator. I was to just going to say they want the refrigerator. I flew with the guy from Samsung. I don't think either yeah. of them are going to be the smart hub. Pad in there. I mean, I still have to go to the refrigerator to get some period, yeah. right? Yeah. I can't change that. Mm -hmm. But why would I go to my refrigerator to turn on my lights? Mm -hmm. I'd rather go to the light switch right here, yeah, right? right? Or better yet, I'd rather go to my smartphone, which is always on me, mm -hmm. 
except now I put it away so it wouldn't interfere. You put it with back the there. It was dingy yes. when you walked in. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but I pick up my smartphone or my tablet. Right. And I click on it. It's a much better interface. Right. right? All right. So you, I have a quote here. This is you said we're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of how um, TV advertising. Uh, in terms of new TV advertising models. And so what I'm really curious about is you were tight with Erwin Efron. We, of course, have, have you know evangelized him. We have the Erwin <coughs> Efron Demystification Award. So demystify this for me. What do you think Erwin well, would like think his name. and do? Yes, of course like you do. Name. It's an Ian He Simonette. spelled it wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he used to joke with me, by the way. He's one of the handful of smartest people I ever had the honor of. So you. many people um, feel that way. So he, many people. He used, to, he used to call me and say, hi, this is Little Erwin. Oh, okay. Because I always joke that I'm short. And he was actually a little shorter than me. Okay. But um, I think that's why he wore the hat. Yeah, he right? okay. got a couple <laughs> inches of that. Just for you, probably. <clears throat> but um, What would he think about what's going on right now? What would he say? He would impart some, you know. I think, some... I think Erwin Efron would have anticipated most of what we see today. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I don't think he would have been at all surprised, and I don't think any of us should be either. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the models are going to flow out of the context that exists and the proactive efforts. Context has come up a lot this week. Mm -hmm. Trust has come up a lot this week. Mm -hmm. um, the role of television has come up. Yeah, and then the third thing is the proactive efforts that we make to evolve things in a direction that serves the best interests of our clients yes. and of our and the consumer. Yeah. Correct. And the consumer. And so, look, um, we have, a, we have a unit inside Group M called Modi Media, which is doing, its current run rate is several hundred million dollars per year of mm -hmm. advanced television work, dynamic ad insertion, addressable, all that stuff. Uh, its growth is constrained only by supply. We have to create more supply and we're active on that front. We think that the role of media itself I already touched on the fact yeah, that yeah. it's not just a better way to train. Yeah. If you look at distribution, remember I said the fourth vector is converging. Yes. Right? Many products that our clients market. So when you buy a tomato, you have to squeeze it. You've got to make sure it's the right color. Mm -hmm. You might sniff at a fruit to determine that mm -hmm. it's right. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to do that with a jug of dishwashing detergent or laundry detergent. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do that with toothpaste. You don't need to do that with a beverage. Right? right. You're familiar enough. Right. right? You trust it. Well, you, trust either, you either trust that you've had a previous uh, purchase history mm -hmm. with it, or you assume it's a commodity and they're interchangeable. Mm -hmm. But in any case, you don't actually have to handle it mm -hmm. before purchase, right? And the heavier and bulkier something is, the more of a pain it is to go Yeah, it's your right? disposable diaper exam. Exactly. So, um, and by the way, I still, I don't get to cook as often as I'd like to. I, I do love to cook. I don't make a decision on what to cook until I go to market. I'm happy about having to do that, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want that grocery list on your I don't your want table. it. There's, there's no emotional fulfillment there for yeah. me, right? Yeah. And so, and it's not sample of one. There's no emotional fulfillment yeah. for everybody. So things are going to change. Mm -hmm. The role of brick and mortar is going to change. And media's role starts to morph to virtual shelf space. If I can't see it on a physical shelf, where am I going to see it, mm -hmm. right? And media has to take steps today to make sure that further information is available, 
that RFIs can be fulfilled. It's your measurement accountability. Measurement accountability and technology evolution. Call it a mandate. That supports yeah. the ultimate objective of having transaction capabilities yeah. on all media, yeah. including linear television. Well, yes, we're, and these we, are all feasible we're asking things. for comparable cross-platform measurement. Right? We're asking for comparable cross-platform cross measurement. The consumer consumers. Yeah, I think, yes, and we have to have it, by the way, because if we don't, we'll never get our attribution models right. 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 Um, so, uh, 2015, what are you most proud of? Biggest success in 2015. I got through it. Ha, ha, ha. I, at least one other person gave that answer. <laughs> 2015 was not the easiest of years, right? It was pretty choppy, I think. It was pretty choppy. Was surprise, there were some surprises in there, right? Mm -hmm. I think we did well. The, you know, the data shows that we picked you up. You did do well. We, we picked up quite a bit of uh, market Mills, right? share. We got General Mills, yep. we got L'Oreal, we got I own a lot of, of stock. We right. used to work there okay. Okay. <laughs> for a long time. We'll do good by you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, Come on. but it's um, now I think 2015 for us was a really really interesting year. All kidding aside, mm -hmm. we have had a seven year roadmap on the technology and data strategy. I didn't know that. And well, I'm not surprised because you have a very um, thoughtful and clear approach. In yes. the way, and, and it comes across in the industry. And we're assembling a jigsaw puzzle, and the pieces mature. The pieces came that makes together. Sense. It's not linear. Yeah. No, it's not linear. And the pieces have come together sufficiently so you can understand you what that image is going to yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. And 2015 well, is the year that that happened. So what are you and projecting? And RedTrack and ComScore obviously were components of that. Mm -hmm. um, on the technology side, you know, there's stuff that I'm not going to talk about openly, mm -hmm. but our ability to conjoin data silos has has now materialized. Uh, we can do end-to-end -end attribution across digital and uh, non-digital sources. Uh, we we can look at the entire consumer journey or marketing funnel in very very unique ways. It's really powerful, and we're very proud of having. Oh, you should be. You really should be. So 2016, what do you predict? For us, 2016 is about really pushing the industry to do things. You know, coming back to the earlier comment I made, mm -hmm. the role of media and the value of media and everything associated with media, the research that supports mm -hmm. it, is at some level when the role of media is to create awareness, mm -hmm. right? Clients consider it a cost item, mm -hmm. sometimes a foolish expense, right? Everybody's trying to cut it. But they need to invest to grow. Well, they do need to invest to grow. History has shown, almost well, without well, exception, well, that when you reduce your spending, mm -hmm. You lose market Unless share. the product doesn't taste good. Right. Well, if you've got a terrible product, <laughs> the food world. If, if you're going to, your if, 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 if you have a terrible product, yeah. you know, yeah, you you can't fully mitigate that issue with. You talked about the improvised no cost, like right, right at the top of the uh, of the conversation. I uh, my some of my most famous comments in meetings were, it just doesn't taste good. <laughs> right. right. And we just kind of level set. You can do all the marketing in the world it's until okay. you oh. fundamentally right. fix this. By the product. way, you can create sampling. You just yes, can't you create can. repurchase. Yeah, right? that's true. So and and you, you almost just, have you to have look at it. Right? Book too. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But I think. Where I was going was that, uh, and it comes back to the comment about having to change the ecosystem. The role of media as an awareness creator is at some level, right? It values media based on the, the, its ability to create awareness. But when media morphs to virtual shelf space, when media becomes transaction capable, then it becomes a cost of sale. Mm -hmm. It becomes cost of distribution. Mm -hmm. 
and you begin to look at things much more directly. Mm -hmm. So you get fully allocated. You, well, you know at what point the incremental sale exceeds your profitability, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which goes back it's to your the early and the old response curve mm -hmm. work that we've all done, mm -hmm. right? That Irwin again was deeply involved in. And so, and by the way, it's not lost on anybody that the shape of a response curve looks just like a one plus reach curve, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's no delta between the two. Mm -hmm. So uh, that tells you right off the bat that unless you're dealing with totally different axis ratios, uh, the two correlate. And they do. Mm -hmm. It ain't brain surgery. Mm -hmm. But if you can show directly that media is actually moving the product, its value skyrockets. And as its value skyrockets, the roles that all of us play, whether you're on the implementation side or the strategy side or the research side or the management side, those roles evolve, mm -hmm. right? I mean, any CPG, any client. So you're on how high is up now? Things are moving yeah. on. And, and up is and way, growth. way higher than we're off the direction. Exactly. So that's, that's wonderfully optimistic for 2016. So You know what? It ain't about optimism. It's about making it happen. Facts, right? Yeah. 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 Just do it, baby. <laughs> Stop bitching. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Erwin Gottlieb. Pleasure. So lovely to spend time with you. Congratulations Thank on, you. on your really clear and crisp take uh, as to how we should be facing the future. Uh, I like your candor about what the what this past year has been like. Um, I really do want to uh, give you tribute for um, taking a stand in the industry. At some level, it isn't even about whether people agree or disagree. We just really need to start having open conversations and get the conversation out with, with all different parties. And, and I think for us, I mean, look, we were the guys who first took a stand on C3. We were the guys who took a stand on C7 and on and on. We were one of the, I mean, if you look at the team, we were the ones who came up with the regression analytics for the conversion from diary to people, mm -hmm. right? It's an ecosystem issue and an ecosystem worry. And if you measure properly and you in, you do things that help clients evaluate the value of things, then the investments grow, and that's a good thing for everybody. Yeah, I, I think that's so important. You know, I just really want to close with with a with a with a tribute to you and um, and. I'm done with tributes. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you have one more today. Um, you know, so many people right now are so, um, as you say, they're bitching. You know, they're so frustrated uh, by, you know, there are too many analytics and there's big data and I don't know what I should do with it. And somebody's moving my cheese and my job's changing. And, you know, there's a marketing person over there doing marketing analytics. Um, and you are, you just fearlessly embrace change. And you have been such an advocate for the measurement industry. And you know that's at the end of the day that's what we're all about at the ARF is really um, improving measurement, but translating it into growth mm -hmm. and making sure that we help our member companies grow their brands. And so well, I well that's a tribute to you guys as well. Thank you. Pleasure.